Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you for joining us for one of our talks today. I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the wonderful Jeff Ward to talk all about his latest television series, Brand New Cherry Flavor. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the way in which you shaped Roy as a character, and in particular because so much of his personality that we see within the show, a huge driving factor of that is his career and his relationship with his career, what his aspirations and goals are, and how he emotionally feels about where he is and, and where some of his vulnerabilities lay from that, which is why he ends up embroiled in everything that he does over these eight episodes. And so was interested in, in how you kind of looked at the scripts and looked between the lines of the script to really shape that side of him so that when we meet him, we have such an immediate sense of, of who he is and all those aspects. That's, uh, yeah, it's interesting because I think um, when I first got the scripts and I started to kind of like uh, look at him as a character and I read a little bit I, I read the book um, but he's which was pretty not helpful because he's not in the book for very long and it's interesting because in the book he's kind of just this like not creepy but but um, kind of stalkerish movie star that has a similar you know getting into the story but it's interesting because um, in the book he goes and visits Boro. Essentially, the scene that happens in the eighth episode is happens in the very beginning of the book, and he goes with a gun to help Lisa confront Boro, and Boro rips his head off. And uh, I thought that it was as soon as I read that, I thought it was pretty brilliant of Nick and Lenore, Nick and Tosca and Lenore Zion, who created it, to um, invert that story point and have him go along for the crazy ride with Lisa, because in my mind, I felt like at first Roy was kind of this stereotypical kind of, you know, uh, dick movie star, very cool guy. And then I felt like as it kind of started to get into it more and more, and I, I find that this happens for me is kind of like you have a lot of ideas and then you show up and, and once you are practically doing the role, like it always feels like things change and my perception of the character changes and it sort of, I guess, like you find yourselves painted, uh, me and the writers found ourselves painted into certain corners that was like, how exactly is he, it, you know, what kind of guy is he to have gotten himself into the situation? And it felt like there was definitely you know, that sort of cocky um, a-hole uh, aspect to him. But I, it, it felt like it very quickly, I understood him to be someone that felt very misunderstood, that felt very, you know, he kind of fell into this uh, 1990 version of, you know, what McConaughey was before the McConaissance, you know, before like everybody was like, oh, Matthew McConaughey is an incredible actor. Like, kind of, you know, it felt like to me, Roy was, he was pre reconnaissance that, like he, he was, he, you know, kind of was in the knockoff Die Hard movie and like the knockoff Lethal Weapon. And he has, you know, he's a star and he's very famous, but I think that I, I, start, I sort of, st because of his obsession with Lisa artistically, which I do believe that was the first obsession, you know, he saw the short film and he kind of, I think, um, thought to himself, this is my ticket into acting like the actors that I admired coming up. I imagined him to be a big fan of Steve McQueen and Marlon Brando and, you know, kind of those actor studio actors, but then finds himself to be kind of the pretty boy action star and is desperate to get out of that. And also I think feels, I think that there's something with um, people that have particularly dark past that they feel responsible for and everything that happened with his sister and how he feels responsible for that. I think he's kind of chasing that self-flagellation and kind of that like existential punishment. So I feel like that is so the driving factor and why he's driving these cars a hundred miles an hour and jumping off buildings and parachuting and kind of doing all this crazy stuff because I think he's trying to accidentally get his comeuppance and come up against the darkness that he feels he deserves. But then when he meets Lisa and things start to really spiral more and more out of control. And like, I remember a moment I didn't really realize from the scripts until we were doing it when he does find the, you know, the body and he wraps it in the shower curtain and he kind of says to her like, and he says to her outside the 
her apartment, you know, like I can't, I don't think I can do this. Like, I think this is all, I think I got to make some different choices here. And, and then reiterates that and kind of, you know, like is then trying to pull himself out of the darkness, but he made the mortal sin of falling in love with her while he was down there. And I have always felt like a huge part of the cautionary tale um, of this whole, be careful what you wish for. Like, I felt like the, the genius of having Roy die at the end is it always felt to me like Roy and Lisa were kind of this Romeo and Juliet star crossed. They could have been the only person to understand the other one's pain and anguish and try to heal them through it. And they found each other in this crazy, you know, uh, random world. And then she, by doing this, cur you know, by putting this curse out into the world, it ends up taking the one thing that was actually more important than the movie and uh, ripping its head off, so. <laughs> I think it's so interesting that you describe it in that way because there's definite moments where we really see different sides of their personality coming out because of the other one. You know, like you were describing how Roy has this, this kind of dance with death and, and this feeling of trying to punish himself for his childhood and, and the death of his sister that we learn about very early on. Um, and then he develops this completely different perspective through the time that he's spending with her, not even, not even just because of all the supernatural and all of those elements, but just from the connection that he has with her and how she makes him feel very different. Um, and similarly, vice versa. The connection is the most dangerous thing. Yeah. I think the connection is the most dangerous thing because that is what makes him, he, ha like, he has the common sense to go, I can't do this anymore, but he doesn't have the willpower to follow through with it mm -hmm. because he's in love with her. And that is, you know, it's it's as as a lot of the greatest stories told, you know, tell us like love makes you do crazy things and ignore ignore your instincts. Did you and Rosa Salazar, who plays Lisa, have any specific conversations about the aspects that they draw out in each other? Or did it really just come through the chemistry that was forged and, and the way that the scripts de developed that relationship? I think actually a bit of both. Um, I, we, we chemistry read together before I got the part and something that was very cool. I think for both Rosa and I was, we, we pretty immediately were like, you know, I think, I think we understood the dynamic and the relationship without talking about it is what we found pretty, you know, immediately. And then we got to then flush it out more and, uh, you know, and, and really start to kind of try to understand exactly what we talked a ton about um her and i talked a lot about the scene where i pick her up at the police station because we were just talking about exactly where she's at mentally and exactly where he's at mentally and what's the most fun way to kind of have him brushing him, have her brushing him off even though he's this crazy movie star and her instincts always really made me laugh because it was always such a funny version of i'm i'm interested but i really ultimately don't give a shit and that to roy who's someone who is you know i think people when you get that famous you there there are less and less people that tell you no or call you on anything or you know really take you to task about anything that you've done everybody is kind of just like yeah 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 and pretends it's all good and so i think like meeting lisa we talked a lot about Exactly. Like, cause we didn't, cause I think that it was important that it also wasn't just like this contentious butting heads relationship, you know, like there had to be that flirtation and that attraction, even if it was not exactly purely, um, you know, I, I think it's, what's so interesting about it is it's not just purely lust. It's really wrapped up in the creative of it. And I think that it's, that's what makes Roy so drawn to her is it's it's the creative pull it's the the lust pull but and it's also that darkness trying to find that pull it's kind of you know he can't help himself but be sucked in by the gravity of her so we always talked about how to make that as realistic as possible and the show itself is so brilliantly bizarre in a lot of the places that it goes a lot of the things that you see happen on screen i mean i was watching it with my cat on my lap and that 
definitely felt very weird. That must have been intense. <laughs> the cat was confused. <laughs> but within that, for your performance, you really have to commit to all of the oddities and all of those moments. And at the same time, make them feel larger than life because they're written that way. And that is what the show is tonally. And at the same time, you're also grounding it through this connection, through this emotional vulnerability, through this connection that he has with Lisa, which must be such a dance and so I wanted to ask you about how performatively you really approached those very different things that it was asking of you within singular moments really awesome uh question because I think that something that we dealt with like for instance I mean obviously like uh I in my opinion the craziest scene of the of the show is uh when her and I are in the motel room and we have that sex scene with her brand new orifice and she you know that was something that was like it was so cool to try and figure out exactly what Roy's reaction to something like that would be and because because it is obviously this surreal kind of heightened um and insane world so it was fascinating for us to always try to keep it as grounded and as realistic as possible but still you've got to like I, Roy has to not be phased when she starts to pull his hand into her side hole and like you know he has to kind of be cool to go with that so what is exactly the psychology of of everything around that in terms of even like five minutes before when she's like, you know, like, and we don't see it on camera, but she's now told him I'm throwing up kittens. And his response is kind of like, so you're throwing up kittens. Like, okay. Like, you know, that's, and it's so funny to me because like, it's always cracking up as I've watched it. Cause I'm, I'm, he's always like, let's see where this goes. <laughs> and it's like, ah, I say not going to a good place. I don't think man, but, um, but it was it was a very it was so interesting because I think it fe I think for Roy there's just an it's just enough of a slippery slope it's just enough of you know if if he had gone home with her the night that he met her at the party and she had a kitten out of her side hole I think he'd probably be like I'm out <laughs> like that's crazy but I think that there was so there's something about the just this much more, just this much more. And like, oh, now someone's been set on fire, but like, that wasn't her, like, you know, that it's, so it's, it's, it was the, it being so gradual that I think allowed him to kind of be like, well, I don't know. I mean, I think I am falling in love with this girl. So it allows him to kind of continually ignore these these wild things and almost like be under the hypnotic spell of it it kind of you know it just kind of i think i think at a certain point almost starts to be like yeah well if it didn't escalate in some weird way i mean like that's kind of what i'm here for so i i think it was just the hypnosis of all of it that for me made me understand why kind of a more realistic more grounded character could get, you know, I use Justin Thoreau and Mulholland Drive a lot as a really cool, like, I think he's such an amazing touchstone in terms of he's kind of, he's never really sure what's going, if, if like, if it's going, what's real and what's not. And like, and he kind of doesn't care. Like he's kind of too drawn, too drawn into being a director and be, you know, like his film. And so it's kind of like, as all these bizarre things keep happening, he just kind of, it feels like starts to kind of just go, you know, more and more resigned to the escalation. And I think that's exactly what happens with Roy. I'm also glad that you brought up that particular scene in the motel with, with, with the cat orifice as well, <laughs> um, because that's filmed very differently from a lot of the rest of the show where we've really seen a lot of steady cam, a lot of tracking shots, a lot of tripod use. And then all of a sudden that scene is much more intimate and handheld and gritty in a completely different way. And so how did you all really want to shape that as like a pivotal shift in how you were telling the story, both cinematically and character wise with those choices? So happy you caught that because that is, it's the only handheld shot in the show. 
And it's really cool. It's really cool for me that you saw that because we were, that's exactly what we were talking about when we were filming it, because I think um, the whole aesthetic of the show is, you know, um, it's very still, it's very, you know, portrait-esque. It's, it's a lot of steady cam and a lot of locked off shots and, um, and it, and, and it, it, it pulls it off beautifully and brilliantly. But Matt Sobel, who directed the fourth episode, I'm pretty sure it was his idea. I don't want to tell any tales out of school, but I, I'm almost positive that it was Matt who kind of uh, convinced Nick that this should be the one moment that it breaks out of that. Because and it and it's amazing because to me it like it stands out so much cinematically because all of the sudden like I you know and I guess it is to people who know that you know are are constantly looking at the difference between (laughs) steady cam and handheld and stuff like that but for me it all the 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 whole feeling of the show if you're into it and if you're drawn into the story by that point to me it's all of a sudden becomes very unpredictable and and um the the feeling of the camera being kind of in that more verite um style and and proximity to us if i always have felt like it's indicative of the fear of both of them like they don't really know what's about to happen and roy in particular but i think even lisa and i feel like there's something in that moment that it's literally breaking out of the plan like you know breaking out of the thought process of what it is that they were doing and that's to me, like it, it honestly feel it, you know, to my eye in the edit, it looks like the cameras ripped off the sticks and kind of like, you know, just kind of immediately, almost like it was this unplanned thing that, you know, like, and, and so I love that the camera work is so indicative of how intimate it is, how realist, how real we're trying to portray the moment, even though it's so heightened and surreal and, also how unpredictable how you know just frightening and and kind of neither one of us knowing where this is about to go and then it's it's pretty cool because uh when obviously it, we did it all what's in the show is pretty much one take and um cut up so there's some effects so you can see my entire arm going inside of her which that's nick okay i didn't that was that's not me <laughs> but uh but you know, when you, and, and she then gets on top of me and she just did this thing where like, she kind of bit my face a little bit. And it was like completely, we were not, we didn't know what was going to happen. And then this amazing thing where then she just like kind of looks directly into camera and it was so, and they kept that in, in, in the end of that shot. And I find it to be harrowing and very like so crazy also because it feels like Roy is still in the story and it feels like there's this moment of her breaking out of it too so it's like I, that not only narratively um and, and and script wise is one of my favorite scenes but I I the execution of it and how it's shot and exactly what you pointed out it going from steady to uh being handheld is you know this kind of cinematic um interpretation of kind of what they're going through and and so it's really cool you caught that because i i love that very much the other scene that i wanted to talk about is the moment where roy gets decapitated especially because it sounds like that really was about in-camera effects using prosthetics using a lot of fake blood having the whole crew in hazmat suits because the amount of blood flying around Um, and so what was that journey and process of of shooting that scene with the fact that everybody wanted it to be completely real on camera and to have as few vfx afterwards in post-production as possible it was a it was a lot more work and a lot more um you know i i it was obviously you know many hours of uh being in the in the casing and and you know they had to do it all the way down to almost my stomach i think and uh you know so there's there's a lot of that and then and then the practicality of shooting it that way and as you said yeah everybody was in hazmat suits and uh which was right before coronavirus so it was really funny because it was like everyone was like can you imagine everybody in hazmat suits it's like yeah give it a month but um but it was uh amazing because i you know grew up on 
all things, you know, particularly 80s and 90s um, Hollywood and, and cinema. And so practical effects and puppetry and prosthetics have always been much more near and dear to me than CG because I just always, I feel like you can always tell a little bit and, and there's just something about it that, you know, when it's of substance, it, it feels a little more real and a little cooler. And it definitely had a lot of, you know, we still had to do plate shots and like, there's still a little bit of CG to kind of, you know, enhance it, but everything is pretty much real. And it like, we had to, I got so covered in blood so many times and like had to change and like, and it was very like, had to lay dying with the machete in my neck many times. And, and then, uh, and I think I've said this once before, but, uh, there was, it was just a funny moment because then I, I changed and I had done all my stuff. And then everybody was then running around going, we're going to, they got it in. We're going to pull your head off. We're going to pull it off and then eat everything outside of it. It's going to be great. Come on. I, we're so excited. And everyone was so excited and it looked so real that I started to be like, this is freaking me out how much this feels like a soccer game that everybody's like, yeah, rip his head off. So it was a very, it was a funny, it became a funny feeling watching everyone uh, as an enthusiastic audience for it. But it was, uh, it was really cool and really, I think came out looking awesome. So it, it's, uh, it was well wor worth the extra work. It, it did come out looking amazing. And there's so much imagery from the show that is going to be seared into my mind for better or worse for a long time. So thank you so much for sharing all of these details from, from the making of the show and your performance. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it.